Over the last two weeks, we have learned about the foundation of our Christian worldview from the first three chapters of Genesis. And the first principle that we have learned about that we should remember today is that God made a perfect world, which he called very good after he created it. It's important that we note that the world that now exists is not the same as the world that God originally created. Since, for example, 10 out of 10 die, and there is pain and suffering in our world today. But God told Adam that they would die only if they ate of the forbidden tree. Secondly, we learned that God made Adam and Eve upright and sinless in his own image. And they had the freedom to choose to love God and obey him or to rebel against his simple commandment about the tree in the midst of the garden. So, we must also note that Adam and Eve were presented with a clear choice when God commanded them not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I should mention that the word knowledge in the name the tree of the knowledge of good and evil could more literally be translated as experience. So Adam and Eve had not actually experienced evil until after they willingly ate of the tree in disobedience. Third, we learned about how Adam and Eve allowed death, suffering, and the curse into the world when they sinned against God. And because of their fall, the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. So the transition from God's original creation that was very good to a world that contained death, suffering, and the curse occurred at the time of the fall of man in Genesis chapter 3. And fourth, we learned that all suffering, pain, and death can be traced back either directly or indirectly to sin, which is rebellion against the law of our Creator. Truly, if no one had ever sinned, no one would have ever suffered or died. So the misuse of the free will of mankind allowed evil, death, suffering, and pain into our existence, and the rest is history. These fundamental facts about the biblical origin of all things, including death and suffering, can be directly observed in the first three chapters of the Bible. And they're repeated and supported in the New Testament by Jesus, Paul, Luke, Jude, and others. Now, the reason we have devoted three weeks to learning about these important issues is because one of the most common reasons for people to reject God and the Bible flows from what has historically been called the problem of evil. We saw last week that the number one question people have for God is why is there suffering in the world? And survey after survey will prove that the suffering mankind experiences in this life often leads people to doubt the existence or character of God. So the way we answer this issue is extraordinarily important. And we should be preparing to answer these foundational questions about suffering long before tragedy strikes, not after. Everyone you know has an unavoidable appointment with what we call physical death, including you and me. And there will undoubtedly be suffering during our lifetimes too. But if we don't spend the time to understand why these things exist in our world according to scripture, and how we should understand and respond to them before the hard times come, we will not be ready to deal with them when they happen, and our emotions become much harder to control. Sadly, many people live their lives pretending that death and suffering don't exist. And when they're inevitably faced with these harsh realities, only then, in a highly illogical, emotional state, do they seek to understand what God's Word teaches on the issues of suffering and evil. Understandably, because of the heightened emotional state suffering often produces, 
The sufferer's logical thinking process is much less rational in the midst of their time of suffering, so they become much less open to the truth of Scripture. Therefore, we need to look very carefully at these issues before or after the storms of life when we're not emotionally overwhelmed. But now that we know the scriptural basics to begin to answer the problem of evil, let me share with you the formal, logical argument that sometimes causes people to question the character or existence of the God of the Bible. Typically, the formal argument known as the problem of evil states, A. God is all-powerful. B. God is all-knowing. C. God is completely good. And D. Evil exists. So this objection against the God of the Bible states that God could stop evil because he is all-powerful. He knows that evil exists because he is all-knowing, and he would want to stop it since he is completely good. Yet, evil still exists. Therefore, the skeptic concludes, God must not exist, or he must not be all-knowing, all-good, or all-powerful. So, some folks attempt to answer these four facts by stating that either God is not all-powerful, all-knowing, or all-good, and by doing this, they deny the character of God. And others simply deny the existence of God, and they claim that the existence of evil means that the God of the Bible could not exist. But the real problem is that this short-sighted classical argument is not really accounting for all of the biblical details presented about God and the world we live in. In fact, it's a gross oversimplification. We can all agree that A, B, C, and D are true. But as we learned in detail over the last few weeks, because God created mankind to enjoy a loving relationship with Him, and love requires the freedom to choose, it was the abuse of man's free will that introduced evil into the world when Adam and Eve disregarded God's commandment. Therefore, one key ingredient to remember in the equation of evil is that God does not force the descendants of Adam to love him and obey his word. He simply warns them of the consequences if they disobey his commandments and allows them to make free choices. Therefore, it bears repeating that this short life is the one and only test that will determine where we spend eternity. And God actually presents his word to stop his creation from committing the sins that cause all evil. So if we refuse to listen to God's word, then we will fail life's test. We will continue to live in sin, and we will end up in hell with the devil and his fallen angels. This means that life is like a sorting process that determines if we are fit for God's kingdom because we choose to love and obey him, or if we will share the fate of Satan and all those who follow him in sinful rebellion against God. The truth is, that every type of evil that exists is a result of the creation rebelling against the Creator. Human evil is a direct result of mankind breaking God's commandments in the present. And natural evil is the consequence of mankind breaking God's commandment in the past, thereby allowing sin, death, suffering, and the curse into the world. Plus, Another biblical truth that the classical argument of the existence of evil ignores is that the Bible refers to a ruler of this world and a god of this age. And when scripture speaks of this individual, it is not referring to our omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent God. Satan, the adversary, is the one that the Bible calls the ruler of this world, 
the God of this age, and the Spirit who is at work in all the children of disobedience. And Jesus told Paul, I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So every single human being is either under Satan's authority or God's. This is why the Bible explains, little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. For he who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And this is also why Jesus explained, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. So we have established over the last few weeks that Adam and Eve committed sin. Then what did that make them? Obviously, at least for a time, they became slaves of sin and children of disobedience who followed Satan and not God. They had fallen into the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. And they gave the serpent authority over themselves, along with every one of their descendants who followed the will of the devil, which is sin. And this is why Satan could say to Jesus about all the kingdoms of the world, I will give all this authority and their glory to you because it has been delivered to me and I give it to whomever I wish. Jesus didn't dispute the devil's claim to authority over the sinful nations of the world and the apostle John even writes that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. You see, the Bible reveals that the fall of Adam and Eve marked the beginning of a cosmic conflict that corrupted all of God's perfect creation and cast every created thing into a raging clash between good and evil. Every descendant of Adam must choose between sin or righteousness, darkness or light, selfishness or love, and Satan or God. And the eternal fate of each soul depends on which side they choose. Plus, in this life's invisible war, Satan is trying to steal souls from their creator by tricking people into sinning. And that's why Jesus said, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. When Adam and Eve sinned, sadly, they submitted themselves to the devil's authority and willingly rejected God's authority. And that is still exactly what happens when any descendant of Adam and Eve chooses to rebel against God and follow Satan's example into sin. Because of this, John also writes, In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. We can either be of God or of the devil. There is no third team in this great invisible war for souls. And over and over again, the scriptures declare that our choices expressed in our actions reveal which team we are on. But when we are choosing sides, we should remember that it was never God who sought to deceive, murder, and devour mankind. Instead, Jesus explained to those who were under Satan's influence, you are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar 
and the father of it. And Peter adds, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So the primary source of all the evil in the world is actually the serpent. And when Adam and Eve heeded the deceitful words of the devil, they introduced the cancer of sin into the world and death along with it. But the devil conveniently tries to pretend like he doesn't exist when the problem of evil is discussed, when in fact he is the author of all evil and the father of all lies. And just as Adam and Eve's sin can never be blamed on God, because they were made upright in the very image of God. No one can blame God for Satan's wickedness either. This is because the Bible records about the cherub we now know as Satan the adversary, or the devil. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created, till iniquity was found in you. So even the devil was made upright by God. But he became puffed up with pride because of his beauty, and he rebelled against his creator instead of being grateful to God for all that he had been given. And by the way, Satan isn't alone in his invisible spiritual war against God's truth, which is why Paul warns us, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. There are many fallen angels who foolishly followed Satan's lies, just like Adam and Eve did, and they now serve under him as the rulers of the darkness of this age that promote wickedness and rebellion towards the Creator. So Satan is the slimy, deceptive captain of the entire anti-God, anti-truth team. His wicked fallen angels serve as regional rulers of wickedness and corruption, and every human being who practices sin, which is the breaking of God's law, has actually joined the side of the serpent in his personal war against God. Therefore, an enormous part of why there is so much suffering and evil in this world is due to the fact that the earth is caught up in this ultimate war for the souls of men. And even the creation itself is currently cursed and corrupted by this terrible ancient conflict. And we must remember that the pain and suffering of this life serves as a tiny microscopic reminder of the much greater suffering that awaits Satan's entire sinful team in hell. While the pleasures of this life are only a minuscule taste of the glories of the kingdom of God that await all that love him and keep his commandments. Plus, we can directly establish that the devil is actually responsible for much of the suffering we experience in this world because after Jesus healed a suffering woman, he asked the indignant ruler of the synagogue, Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? And Peter even described the ministry of the Messiah by saying that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So the people Jesus healed and cast out demons from were oppressed by the devil, not by God. And Jesus came to destroy the wicked works of the devil. Also, Jesus, as God manifested in the flesh, stepped into the mess our rebellion against him made to do more than just heal those oppressed by the devil. Because scripture even explains, inasmuch then, as the children have partaken in flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. But now that we have completely dismantled the oversimplified classical logical argument against God, known as the problem of evil, 
Let's consider why our loving Creator allows this spiritual warfare that causes so much suffering and devastation to continue. The Apostle Peter once wrote, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now the promise Peter is referring to is explained a few verses before when he wrote, Scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And Peter also writes about this same promise saying, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So when we read a literal translation of 2 Peter 3, 9, which says the Lord of promise is not slow, as some deem slowness, but is long-suffering toward us, not having purposed any to perish, but all to come to repentance, we first must understand that the promise Peter is referring to is the guarantee that the Lord of glory will return to this earth and recreate the perfect heaven and earth that he promised in Isaiah 65. Then secondly, we must recognize that God is being patient or long-suffering towards mankind. And this indicates that he is not satisfied with the current fallen and rebellious state of his creation. But if he returns before the last soul is saved, his ultimate purpose would not be realized. So God's ultimate purpose is for all to come to repentance and salvation through his son Jesus Christ. So they can share in the joy of his love for all eternity. And he does not desire that anyone perish in hell. So he is patiently enduring the disaster sin has made of his creation, thereby allowing every soul the chance to repent and turn back to him before the end of the age. Truly, our Lord Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. And while Satan comes to steal and to kill and to destroy, Jesus came that we may have life and that we may have it more abundantly. Plus, he is made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. Truly, God our Savior desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. But Satan and his minions desire for all men to perish with them in hell. So they fill the world with wicked lies and sinful temptations designed to ensnare mankind into continued rebellion against God. And even though it is God's desire that no one perish, when Jesus was asked, Lord, are there few who are saved? He said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. And in another place he said, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way, which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Scripture sadly explains, that most people are following Satan to eternal weeping and gnashing of teeth in hell, even though God clearly doesn't will for that to be their destiny. And this demonstrates beyond all reasonable doubt that mankind has the freedom to choose and we can foolishly resist God's amazing loving will for us. 
This is why Stephen rebuked the Sanhedrin by saying, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. And this is also why Jesus cried out, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. God has clearly declared all day long, I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. And even though this was originally said to Israel, it really applies to most of the descendants of Adam who have unknowingly sided with the serpent against the will of their creator. There is a reason Jesus taught us to pray to our Father in heaven, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because God's will is not being done on earth as it is in heaven. However, when Jesus brings the kingdom of God to earth in all of its fullness, he will rule from Zion with a rod of iron and this prayer will truly be answered. And while God has said, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. He has a special way of perceiving the sad reality of mankind's rebellion against his love that puts things into the proper perspective, especially in regards to hell. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First, Gather the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. And later Jesus explained, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. But the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire, there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Friends, we can either be children of the kingdom who follow Jesus and practice righteousness, or we can be children of Satan who follow lies and practice lawlessness. This world is limited to only these two choices, according to the one who created it. And he will also be 
the final judge of every soul. And praise the Lord. The Bible doesn't only describe the origin of evil and the cause of suffering and death. It also describes how we can have eternal life through the cross of Jesus Christ, our victorious Messiah. And when the last human soul is saved and God finally fulfills his long-awaited promise of a new heavens and a new earth, his plan will be complete. And scripture assures us that God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless, remembering you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps.